Horror Babbles, The Dunwich Horror. Let's try that again. Now then, back to the story. A quieter, yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed door of a shelf-lined room in Arkham. The curious manuscript record, or diary of Wilbur Waitley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in languages both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaded Arabic used in Mesopotamia, being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher, though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue even when applied on the basis of every tongue a writer might conceivably have used. The ancient books taken from Waitley's quarters, while absorbingly interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science, were of no assistance whatever in this matter. One of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp, was in another unknown alphabet, this one of a very different cast and resembling Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Waitley matter and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formulae of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from old times and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital, since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that, considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formulae and incantations. Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. On the evening of September 2nd, having concluded that the text was indeed in English, Dr. Armitage read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Waitley's Annals. It was in truth a diary, as all had thought, and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under the electric light, turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. He had nervously telephoned his wife he would not be home and when she brought him a breakfast from the house, he could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day he read on, now and then halted maddeningly as a reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought him, but he ate only the smallest fraction of either. Toward the middle of the next night, he drowsed off in his chair, but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares, almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to man's existence that he had uncovered. As twilight fell on September 6th, he finished his terrible perusal and sank back exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half comatose state, but he was conscious enough to warn her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander toward the notes he had taken. Weakly rising, he gathered up the scribbled papers and sealed them all in a great envelope which he immediately placed in his inside coat pocket. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, but what in God's name can we do? 
Stop them, stop them, he would shout. Those Wankleys meant to let them in, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur came here to his death. And at that rate... He woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober, with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon, he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for conference. And the rest of that day and evening, the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculation, in the most desperate debate. Oh, strange and terrible books were drawn from the stacked shelves and from secure places of storage. And diagrams and formulae were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism, there was none. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Whateley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. No, sir. All day Sunday, Armitage was busy comparing formulae and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more he reflected on the hellish diary, the more he was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Waitley had left behind him. The earth-threatening entity which, unknown to him, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the Dunwich Horror. Shush! Listen! That's just Johnson, the Smith's guard dog. Yeah? Sounds like he he's guarding all right. Maybe so, Mr. Block. Maybe so. You just drink your beer, sir. Leave Johnson to his garden. Well, anything you say, bartender? Friday morning, Armitage, Rice, and Morgan set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about one in the afternoon. From the air of hushed fright at Osborne's store, they knew something hideous had happened, and soon learned of the annihilation of the Elma Fry house and family. Throughout that afternoon, they rode around Dunwich, questioning the natives concerning all that had occurred, and seeing for themselves with rising pangs of horror the drear fry ruins with their lingering traces of the tarry stickiness, the blasphemous tracks in the fry yard, the wounded Seth Bishop cattle, and the enormous swaths of disturbed vegetation in various places. The trail up and down Sentinel Hill seemed to Armitage of almost cataclysmic significance, and he looked long at the sinister altar-like stone on the summit. At length, the visitors, apprised of a party of state police which had come from Aylesbury that morning, in response to the first telephone reports of the Fry tragedy, decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, they found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in a car, but now the car stood empty near the ruins in the fry yard. The natives, all of whom had talked with the policemen, seemed at first as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. Then Sam Hutchins thought of something and turned pale, nudging Fred Farr and pointing to the dank, deep hollow that yawned close by. God, old Sam said, I told them not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody would do it with them tracks and that smell and the whippoorwills a screeching down there in the dark of noonday. A cold shudder ran through natives and visitors alike, and every ear seemed strained in a kind of instinctive, unconscious listening. Armitage, now that he had actually come upon the horror and its monstrous work, trembled with the responsibility he felt to be his. Night would soon fall, and it was then that the mountainous blasphemy lumbered upon its eldritch course. The old librarian rehearsed the formulae he had memorized and clutched the paper containing the alternative one he had not memorized. He saw that his electric flashlight was in working order. Rice, beside him, took from a suitcase a metal sprayer of the sort used in combating insects, whilst Morgan uncased the big game rifle on which he relied, despite his colleagues' warnings that no material weapon would be of help. 
Armitage, having read the hideous diary, knew painfully well what kind of a manifestation to expect, but he did not add to the fright of the Dunwich people by giving any hints or clues. He hoped that it might be conquered without any revelation to the world of the monstrous thing it had escaped. As the shadows gathered, the natives commenced to disperse homeward, anxious to bar themselves indoors, despite the present evidence that all human locks and bolts were useless before a force that could bend trees and crush houses when it chose. They shook their heads at the visitor's plan to stand guard at the fry ruins near the glen, and as they left, had little expectancy of ever seeing the watchers again. Just picture it, Mr. Block. There were rumblings under the hills that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while, a wind sweeping up out of Cold Spring Glen would bring a touch of ineffable fetter to the heavy night air, such a fetter as all three of the watchers had smelled once before when they stood above a dying thing that had passed for fifteen years and a half as a human being. But the looked-for terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and Armitage told his colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanly, and the night sounds ceased. It was a gray, bleak day, with now and then a drizzle of rain, and heavier and heavier clouds seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. The men from Arkham were undecided what to do. Seeking shelter from the increasing rainfall beneath one of the few undestroyed Fry outbuildings, they debated the wisdom of waiting, or of taking the aggressive and going down into the glen in quest of their nameless, monstrous quarry. The downpour waxed in heaviness, and rather like the weather here tonight, distant peals of thunder sounded from far horizons. Sheet lightning shimmered, and then a forky bolt flashed near at hand, as if descending into the accursed glen itself. The sky grew very dark, and the watchers hoped that the storm would prove a short, sharp one, followed by clear weather. No such luck. It was still gruesomely dark when, not much over an hour later, a confused babel of voices sounded down the road. Another moment brought to view a frightened group of more than a dozen individuals, running, shouting, and even whimpering hysterically. Someone in the lead began sobbing out words, and the Arkham visitors started violently when those words developed a coherent form. Oh my god! My god! It's going again! And this time by day! It's out! It's out of moving this very minute! And only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all! Tell him! Tell him, Earl! An hour ago, Zeb Waitley here heard the phone ringing. And it was Mrs. Corey that lives down by the junction. She says the hired boy Luther was out driving in the cows from the storm after the big bolt, when he see all the trees bending at the mouth of the glen, opposite side of this, and smelt the same awful smell like he smelt when he found the big tracks last Monday morning. And she says he says there was a swishing, lapping sound, more than what the bending trees and bushes could make. And all of a sudden, the trees along the row began to get pushed one side, and there was an awful stomping and splashing in the mud. But mind you, Luther, he didn't see nothing at all, only the bending trees and underbrush. But, but that ain't the trouble now. That was only the start. Zeb here was calling folks up, and everybody was listening in when a call from Seth Bishop's cut in. His housekeeper, Sally, was carrying on fits of kill. She'd just seen the trees bending beside the road, and says there was kind of a mushy sound, like an elephant puffing and treading, heading for the house. And the dogs were all barking and whining awful. And, and then she let out a terrible yell and says the shed down the road had just caved in like the storm had blown it over. Only the wind wasn't strong enough to do that. Everybody was listening, and we could hear lots of folks on the wire gasping. Then Sally says the front yard picket fence had just crumbled up, though there was no sign of what done it. Then everybody on the line could hear Chauncey and old Seth Bishop yelling too. And Sally was shrieking out that something heavy had struck the house. Not lightning or nothing, but something heavy against the front that kept launching itself again and again, 
though you couldn't see nothing out the front windows. And then, and then... Take your time. And then, Sally, she yelled out, Oh, help! The house is caving in! And on the wire, we could hear a terrible crashing and screaming. Just like when Elmer Fry's place was took. Only worse! That's all. Not a sound nor squeak over the phone after that. Just still like. We that heard it got out Fords and wagons and rounded up as many able-bodied folks as we could get at Corey's place and came up here to see what you thought best to do, Dr. Armitage. We must follow it. Christ on his throne, no. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You know that those Waitleys were wizards. Well, this thing is a thing of wizardry and must be put down by the same means. What? I've seen Wilbur Waitley's diary and read some of the strange old books he used to read. And I think I know the right kind of spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course, one can't be sure, but we can always take a chance. It's invisible. I knew it would be. But there's a powder in this long-distance sprayer that might make it show up for a second. Later on, we'll try it. What? Oh, it's a frightful thing to have alive. But it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world has escaped. Now, we've only this one thing to fight, and it can't multiply. It can, though, do a lot of harm. So we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be it. All right, don't get, all right, we must follow it. And the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I don't know your roads very well, but I have an idea there might be a shorter cut across lots. How about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The group shuffled about a moment, and then Earl Sawyer spoke softly pointing with a grimy finger through the steadily lessening rain. Armitage, with Rice and Morgan, started to walk in the direction indicated, and most of the natives followed slowly. The sky was growing lighter, and there were signs that the storm had worn itself away. Courage and confidence were mounting, though the twilight of the almost perpendicular wooded hill which lay toward the end of their shortcut and among whose fantastic ancient trees they had to scramble as if up a ladder, put these qualities to a severe test. Another round, gentlemen? Aye. Mm -hmm. Under normal circumstances, I'd say I'd had enough. Well, I did say you might not want to know, Mr. Block. More fool me. At length, the group emerged on a muddy road to find the sun coming out. They were a little beyond the Seth Bishop place, but bent trees and hideously unmistakable tracks showed what had passed by. Only a few moments were consumed in surveying the ruins just around the bend. It was the Fry incident all over again, and nothing dead or living was found in either of the collapsed shells, which had been the Bishop house and barn. No one cared to remain there amidst the stench and tarry stickiness but all turned instinctively to the line of horrible prints leading on toward the wrecked Waitley farmhouse and the altar-crowned slopes of Sentinel Hill. As the group passed the side of Wilbur Waitley's abode, they shuddered visibly and seemed again to mix hesitancy with their zeal. It was no joke tracking down something as big as a house that one could not see, but that had all the vicious malevolence of a demon. Opposite the base of Sentinel Hill, the tracks left the road, and there was a fresh bending and matting visible along the broad swath marking the monster's former route to and from the summit. Armitage produced a pocket telescope of considerable power and scanned the steep green side of the hill. Then he handed the instrument to Morgan, whose sight was keener. After a moment of gazing, Morgan cried out sharply, passing the glass to Earl Sawyer, and indicating a certain spot on the slope with his finger. Sawyer fumbled a while, but eventually focused the lenses with Armitage's aid. When he did so, his cry was less restrained than Morgan's had been. Then the germ of panic seemed to spread among the seekers. It was one thing to chase the nameless entity, but quite another to find it. Spells might be all right, but suppose they weren't. Can you imagine that, Mr. Block? Voices began questioning Armitage about what he knew of the thing, and no reply seemed quite to satisfy. In the end, 
the three men from Markham, old, white-bearded Dr. Armitage, stocky, iron-gray Professor Rice, and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan, ascended the mountain alone. After much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use, they left the telescope with the frightened group that remained in the road. And as they climbed, they were watched closely by those among whom the glass was passed around. It was hard going, and Armitage had to be helped more than once. High above the toiling group, the great swath trembled as its hellish maker repassed with snail-like deliberateness. Then it was obvious that the pursuers were gaining. Curtis Whiteley was holding the telescope when the Arkham party detoured radically from the swath. He told the crowd that the men were evidently trying to get to a subordinate peak which overlooked the swath at a point considerably ahead of where the shrubbery was now bending. This, indeed, proved to be true, and the party was seen to gain the minor elevation only a short time after the invisible blasphemy had passed it. Then Wesley Corey, who had taken the glass, cried out that Armitage was adjusting the sprayer which Rice held, and that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling that this sprayer was expected to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Two or three of them shut their eyes, but Curtis Waitley snatched back the telescope and strained his vision to the utmost. He saw that Rice, from the party's point of vantage above and behind the entity, had an excellent chance of spreading the potent powder with marvelous effect. Those without the telescope saw only an instant's flash of gray cloud, a cloud about the size of a moderately large building near the top of the mountain. Curtis, who had held the instrument, dropped it with a piercing shriek into the ankle-deep mud of the road. He reeled and would have crumpled to the ground had not two or three others seized and steadied him. All he could do was moan, Oh, great God! There was a pandemonium of questioning, and only Henry Wheeler thought to rescue the fallen telescope and wipe it clean of mud. Curtis was past all coherence, and even isolated replies were almost too much for him. The things they say he muttered, bigger than a barn, all made of squirming ropes, shaped like a hen's egg, bigger than anything, with dozens of legs like hogsheads that half shut up when they step. Nothing solid about it, all like jelly, and made of separate wriggling ropes pushed close together. Great bulging eyes all over it, ten or twenty mouths or trunks sticking out all along the sides, big as stovepipes, and all tossing and opening and shutting. All gray with blue or purple rings. And that half face on top. Jesus. This final memory, whatever it was, proved too much for poor Curtis, and he collapsed completely before he could say more. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins carried him to the roadside and laid him on the damp grass. Henry Wheeler, trembling, turned the rescue telescope on the mountain to see what he might. Through the lenses were discernible three tiny figures, apparently running toward the summit as fast as the steep incline allowed. Only these nothing more. Then everyone noticed a strangely unseasonable noise in the deep valley behind, and even in the underbrush of Sentinel Hill itself. It was the piping of unnumbered whippoorwills, and in their shrill chorus there seemed to lurk a note of tense and evil expectancy. Earl Sawyer now took the telescope and reported the three figures as standing on the topmost ridge, virtually level with the alder stone, but at a considerable distance from it. One figure, he said, seemed to be raising its hands above its head at rhythmic intervals, and as Sawyer mentioned the circumstance, the crowd seemed to hear a faint, half-musical sound from the distance, as if a loud chant were accompanying the gestures. The weird silhouette on that remote peak must have been a spectacle of infinite grotesqueness and impressiveness but no observer was in a mood for aesthetic appreciation. "'I guess he's saying the spell,' whispered Wheeler as he snatched back the telescope. The whippoorwills were piping wildly, and in a singularly curious irregular rhythm, quite unlike that of the visible ritual. Suddenly, 
the sunshine seemed to lessen without the intervention of any discernible cloud. It was a very peculiar phenomenon, and was plainly marked by all. A rumbling sound seemed brewing beneath the hills, mixed strangely with a concordant rumbling which clearly came from the sky. Lightning flashed aloft, and the wandering crowd looked in vain for the portents of storm. The chanting of the men from Arkham now became unmistakable, and Wheeler saw through the glass that they were all raising their arms in the rhythmic incantation. The change in the quality of the daylight increased, and the crowd gazed about the horizon in wonder, a purplish darkness, born of nothing more than a spectral deepening of the sky's blue, pressed down upon the rumbling hills. Then the lightning flashed again, somewhat brighter than before, and the crowd fancied that it had showed a certain mistiness around the altar stone on the distant height. No one, however, had been using the telescope at that instant. The whippoorwills continued their irregular pulsation, and the natives of Dunwich braced themselves tensely against some imponderable menace with which the atmosphere seemed surcharged. Without warning came those deep, cracked, raucous vocal sounds which will never leave the memory of the stricken group who heard them. Not from any human throat were they born, for the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather would one have said they came from the pit itself, had not their source been so unmistakably the altar stone on the peak. It is almost erroneous to call them sounds at all, since so much of their ghastly timbre spoke to dim seats of consciousness and terror far subtler than the ear. Yet one must do so, since their form was indisputably, though vaguely, that of half-articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and the thunder above which they echoed, yet did they come from no visible being, and because imagination might suggest a conjectural source in the world of non-visible beings, the huddled crowd at the mountain's base huddled still closer, and winced as if in expectation of a below. I heard something that night, better to forget, methinks. Just imagine it. That was all. The pallid group in the road, still reeling at the indisputably English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone, were never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently at the terrific report which seemed to rend the hills, the deafening, cataclysmic peal whose source, be it inner earth or sky, no hearer was ever able to place. A single lightning bolt shot from the purple zenith to the altar stone, and a great tidal wave of viewless force and indescribable stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside. Trees, grass, and underbrush were whipped into a fury, and the frightened crowd at the mountain's base, weakened by the lethal fetter that seemed about to asphyxiate them, were almost hurled off their feet. Dogs howled from the distance. Green grass and foliage wielded to a curious sickly yellow-gray, and over field and forest were scattered the bodies of dead whippoorwills. The stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day there is something queer and unholy about the growths on and around that fearsome hill. Curtis Wakeley was only just regaining consciousness when the Arkham men came slowly down the mountain and the beams of a sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. They were grave and quiet and seemed shaken by memories and reflections even more terrible than those which had reduced the group of natives 
to a state of cowed quivering. In reply to a jumble of questions, they only shook their heads and reaffirmed one vital fact. The thing is gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of and can never exist again. It was an impossibility in a normal world. Only the least fraction was really matter in any sense we know. It was like its father, and most of it has gone back to him in some vague realm or dimension outside our material universe. Some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy could ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence, and in that pause the scattered senses of poor Curtis Whiteley began to knit back into a sort of continuity, so that he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up where it had left off, and the horror of the sight that had prostrated him burst in upon him again. Oh my God, that half-face, that half-face on top of it, that face with the red eyes and crinkly albino hair, and no chin. It was an octopus, centipede, spider kind of thing, but there was a half-shaped man's face on top of it, and it looked like Wizard Wakeley's, only it was yards and yards across. Then Joe Osborne questioned the Arkham men anew. George, what was it anyhow, and however did young Wizard Waitley call it out of the air? Armitage chose his words very carefully. It was, well, it was mostly a kind of force that doesn't belong in our part of space. A kind of force that acts and grows and shapes itself by other laws than those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things from outside, and only very wicked people and very wicked cults ever try to. There was some of it in Wilbur Waitley himself, enough to make a devil and a precocious monster of him, and to make his passing out a pretty terrible sight. I'm going to burn his accursed diary, and if you folks are wise, you'll dynamite that altar stone up there, and pull down all the rings of standing stones on the other hills. Things like that brought down the beings those Waitleys were so fond of, the beings they were going to let in tangibly to wipe out the human race and drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as to this thing we've just sent back, the Waitleys raised it for a terrible part in the doings that were to come. It grew fast and big, from the same reason that Wilbur grew fast and big, but it beat him, because it had a greater share of the outsideness in it. You needn't ask how Wilbur called it out of the air. He didn't call it out. It was his twin brother, but it looked more like the father than he did. Huh. Those Whateleys, what customers they would have made. I think you might have had a touch too much to drink, sir. <laughs> I happen to agree with you, bartender. Will you be staying for just the one night then, sir?
If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.